So, hello everybody. Um, thank you for coming. And I would like to do some time travel with you. We will stay here in Paris, but we will go back. We, oh, let's see if the time travel device works. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, that's bad. Well, we go back a few years to the French Revolution here in Paris. So Paris looked a little bit different at that time. We had lots of small, narrow, um, winding alleys in Paris. So it was very easy at that time for the revolutionaries to um, block, um, to block those alleys and prevent the military from moving to one place to the other. Several years later, um, Napoleon III realized that this was one factor which might um, make the likelihood higher that something like this will happen again. So what he did was he reassembled some parts of Paris. So he got rid of some houses and built these broad boulevards and passages next to each other like we know it from today. With this architecture, it's very difficult to use some barrels and prevent the military to move from one place to another place in the city. So Napoleon changed the architecture of Paris in order to control the power. And through history, humans um, had a lot of technologies or introduced a lot of technologies which shifted power from people to other people or changed distribution between different uh, people around the world. Like we had uh, reading and writing, which changed who is in power and who is uh, not in power for a longer time. Just think about how long women were not allowed to read or write. Mathematics changed the way how power is distributed. You were able to do commerce and um, science. We had agriculture, which allowed, us, uh, allowed some groups to stay in one place and also to gather more property. Shipping changed the way how we deal with products around the world. So we could ship things which grow in one area of the world to other places, but it also enabled things like uh, colonialization or slavery. And nowadays, more and more of our life is influenced by computers, by software. So, this is something which people out there might still recognize as a computer, the laptops and desktops machines out there. You also know that um, the internet is run in such places like this on servers, a lot of software is running which is influencing our lives. A lot of people don't still recognize that uh, you also have routers in your home which uh, influence on who gets access to the internet and who from the internet gets access to your private network at home. People are running around with mobile phones without maybe realizing that software is running on them and that the software is influencing how you can communicate um, and um, who decides who is able to communicate. And there are cars uh, out there and other devices which uh, have lots of computers on them. And uh, those machines, depending on what software is running on them, might allow their users to do certain things or restrict them to do certain things. And in future, probably more. Same for planes, television, washing machines, all those devices which uh, before we are not running software at all. So we are surrounded by, by machines, by devices, which are running software, which is influencing what we can do and what we cannot do. And 
sometimes not even outside of us, but inside of our bodies, like with uh, pacemakers or hearing aids. So those are all around us. I mean, you, you know all this, that we are surrounded by software. A lot of people in our society, they don't realize that yet, how influential software is and how uh, much those um, rules implemented in the software might restrict their lives. We also have um, not just devices, but more and more processes which, processes which are dominated uh, or influenced by, by software. For example, here from France, there is a software which decides who will be allowed to go to which university. And um, in the old times, that was something where there were procedures written down, like how this is going. Um, now this software was giving an output, like, okay, you are now allowed to go to this university. But it was not clear under why these decisions were made like this. Why some people were allowed to go to one university, but some were not allowed to go to this university. And um, the pupils association here in France, they, um, they made a freedom of information request for this software and said, we want to find out how is it happening that one that person gets into this university and another doesn't. We would like to see like, what are those rules implemented in this software. And first, the authorities argued that they cannot publish the source code because then hackers might attack the system. Um, but after some more back and forth, they were, um, um, they were given right that, they, uh, that the authorities have to publish the source code. That was the time when, uh, when people could then understand what are those actual rules in this and could argue if this is something which is fair. For example, it turned out that um, the software was giving a higher chance for pup pupils who live close to a university than to those who live further away from a university. Something which maybe, if you think about it as a developer, yeah, it makes sense, people don't have to travel as far. The other result was that um, a lot of the high profile universities, they are located in districts where you have to pay a very high rent. So if you give a higher priority to pupils who live in those areas where you have to pay higher rent, it might also influence um, the distribution in a way that pupils from high income families will be able to go to these high profile universities and afterwards get a higher paid job and that some distribution in the society will not change. So that was something which was possible after the publication of the source code to have this discussion. Before that, you always just had to guess what might be in there or not. In the UK and the US, Nowadays, around 60% of the jobs, they are um, before the, uh, screened by software from, I think, around three um, software providers. And this software already sorts out some people. So 30% um, of the applicants, um, the applications, they will never be seen by humans. The source code of this is secret, the companies don't publish that. So this raises a lot of questions for, uh, for the society, like why do some people not get some jobs? Why is it that those people often look different than others or um, that they are from some poorer areas, that they are not allowed to, to get those higher paid jobs? So through some court cases, they found out some of the, some of the aspects which are um, considered there, like um, the income of, uh, of the area you come from, um, then uh, also um, some things like spelling. But uh, then in, in the end, it also turned out that because of some of those factors, 
it appears that there's huge discrimination against black people. But you don't know how exactly this is happening. Just that a large amount of companies and, uh, is, is using the software and um, this decides on the decision who will get a job and who will never be invited for a job interview. That's something which can turn out quite problematic for a society if you cannot have any discussion about that and uh, think about if, if this is a fair, um, a fair procedure. It's also for people, uh, lawyers who want, or, or, or trade unions, when they would like to argue about this, it's very difficult to argue about uh, such procedures when the companies say, well, that's a business secret. We will not tell you how we are doing this. And as a final example from, from this category, there is a software uh, which is used in almost every US state which uh, predicts how likely it is that you will become an, a criminal offender again after you were offending once. So the software says the likelihood that you will do this crime again is 60% or 80%. And this number is then used in some states even to uh, decide about the sentence length of that person. And the lawyer of the person who was uh, offending, um, was violating a law, couldn't even argue about why is this number 80% and not 40 because it's secret. And it's a huge problem for society if you think about, like, if people, uh, they will um, be sent to, to prison for five years longer um, because the software says so, and there is, can be no argumentation, uh, no discussion, if those are um, factors which are fair and good, and uh, if those are things we would like to have in our society that we predict the likelihood higher because uh, someone is from a poor area or because they have relatives who take drugs, things like this. And there's a huge difference between, between law and norms on one side and, um, and architecture or software. So when we look at this street and I tell you that there will be no police, no cameras, no other human being or living being around here, who of you would drive a little bit faster than 100? Some will risk it. <laughs> okay. So some of you would break the law by driving faster than 100. <laughs> now, who of you would drive faster than 100 on this street? Also, it's not forbidden. <laughs> I thought you were French. <laughs> <laughs> so the difference here is that in this situation, when you drive faster, it, you, you don't need a police officer to punish that person. There are some laws of physics who will punish you. And even if you don't know about those laws of physics and you um, took a break in, uh, in school at that time and played a little bit around with uh, another device or played with your uh, classmates, it doesn't matter. You don't need to know about this Newton things. Uh, you will still fall down there with your car when you're driving 150 kilometers an hour there. With laws, you need someone, first of all, you, you, you need to have seen the sign there that it's 100 kilometers per hour is the speed limit. If you haven't seen it, it's difficult for you to adhere to it. Then afterwards, you need someone who actually um, makes sure that this uh, law is then fulfilled so that they say, okay, you, um, you broke this law, so now we will punish you. 
And the punishment also doesn't come directly. So you might have to be able to argue around, like I was faster than 100 because my wife was uh, sitting next to me and she was bleeding and I wanted to be faster at the hospital. I think that a judge might then argue, okay, would be fine. Here, there is no much, not much arguing with uh, the laws of physics. And while some of those uh, laws like gravitation and so on, they are things where it's easier for us to think about what will happen, like uh, when I take this, this glass here and open my hands, I think most people here in the room, you will be able to predict what will happen. While when we are in, uh, in a, let's say, virtual room, where these uh, laws are um, influenced by software and written down in software, anything can happen. I could open my hands and uh, the glass will go up to the ceiling. I might open my hands and the glass will stay here. Or I open my hands and you are gone, or I am gone, or whatever. We don't know. If we don't know what is written down in the software, we have no clue what will come next. What will be the consequences for us when we do certain things? And what are the rules which uh, influence what we can do in this, uh, in this environment and what not? Who knows this Frenchman? Anyone here? Okay, that's uh, Montesquieu. And uh, Montesquieu is uh, famous for the concept of the distribution or the separation of power. So um, in a democracy, you separate the powers by the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. And you also have several levels uh, in in a uh, democratic society, um, um, state apparatus or also different institutions. And you make sure that you distribute power amongst those different levels. So that there is not one person who can rule everybody. So to make that a bit clearer, when you think about scissors, stone, and paper, it would not be fun if the stone always wins. I think most people will stop after playing it at least for a few minutes. Uh, they will not continue. While in a democracy or in a, in, a, in a state, it's not about fun. This distribution of power will, um, will influence if you might go to jail or if um, you or relatives might die because they have opinions which... Uh, some people don't like, or um, someone has some other interests in this. So this is a very crucial um, component of our democracy, that you make sure that the, um, the institutions are set up in a way that you could give every position in there to your worst opponent without influencing your well-being. So when we take this, and think about the theory, like okay, we have those institutions. Now we have, uh, we elected in a society, we elected a president, and that president then has a lot of power. In this case here, then about um, parts of the military. The question is, this does not consider technology. Is, is it like this, or might it be more like this? who will decide about that, what will happen when you press this red button. And are those people um, where there is a democratic control? Or will it be just a few companies who can decide what will happen and what not? So free software is, a, is one way to distribute power in technology. So we make sure that there is no discrimination who is allowed to use the software. So it's not just a few people who can, who can use this and, and take it for their advantages to increase power. People are allowed to study how that works and tell others about how the software works. So you can understand uh, the rules implemented in these devices and those procedures surrounding us. And we can have a debate about that in our 
society. You can share that again with others, and you can then also adopt, uh, adapt the, the software to your needs as an individual, as a company, organization, or as the government. So you can make sure that the, um, the rules are implemented the way you decided, and not that some, someone else decides about the rules and you have no other way than to adhere to them too. So, of course, um, free software, software freedom is just one puzzle in this, um, in this picture of um, how to um, preserve and uh, our, our democracy in a world where there is more and more uh, digital technologies. But we think that it's an important puzzle piece because, as mentioned before, there are so many, it's, it's in so many areas of our uh, life nowadays. The, the way for, uh, for software freedom and for making sure that we, we can preserve those other, um, those other freedoms in our society as well, that's a very long-term path. We will take a lot of time to, to uh, bring that forward. So um, when, you, when you think about it, um, how long it took societies to, um, to introduce some other freedoms, like the freedom of the press, uh, how long that took that uh, people, um, people got that in, in countries, that's a very long-term um, achievement. So, but still, on this way, we believe that there are a few things which are, which are crucial, where we are working on for, for the FSFE. So, one part is that we believe it's crucial that people out there understand that free software grants them those four freedoms. That there is no discrimination in the usage, that you can study the source code, understand how that works, make sure that people who understand that can talk with others about how this works and there could be a discussion about um, if things are right or might be wrong and if it would be good to change things, that they can share the software with others and that you can make those improvements or changes to software. So it's not you who have to change because of the software, but that you are able to change software to fit your needs especially on levels like the governments. So, and this is something where um, you explain that to people, you explain it again and again and again and then again, and sometimes people get frustrated with this, uh, where it's, where it's um, important to remember that it's most of the time other people. So, I mean, as a school teacher, you also teach some things every year but it's to different pupils. And the same thing is true for, for uh, software freedom. When we talk about those issues to others, we have to repeat ourselves again and again because it's more people we are talking to and a lot of times different people. We should not become impatient about that or um, yeah, stop doing this. We want to make sure that uh, political decision makers that they understand how this whole part about technology and software freedom influences other freedoms like freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, transparency, privacy, um, economic well-being, that they understand this better and that they also consider this when they take decisions. We think it's important to provide um, resources and support to people who are actually um, promoting the idea of software freedom, um, who are developing um, software, um, free software, or um, somehow else being involved in this. So um, this, is, this is something which on one side is for, for people already involved in free software, that they have materials, that they have uh, information, material to, to promote this. But it's not just for organizations in the area um, of technology or in the area of uh, free software. It's also for organizations like unions in the case of this, um, in the case of those job applications. They also have to understand this technology and how this is influencing their work. Or pupil organization with this uh, case from the French universities 
or um, lawyers who are defending clients uh, who might go on death penalty because some computer says 90%. And so there's uh, environmental organizations because of uh, some software running on cars uh, trying to circumvent uh, environmental laws. So this is something where we have to work more and more with organizations who are active in other parts of our society who, uh, whom we have to help to understand those uh, questions about technology. And um, we have to um, remove barriers, legal barriers, um, regulations, which, um, which prevent us to further use or develop free software. So I will mention also one or two uh, examples later. Um, but those are things that it should not be prevented by laws to use and develop free software. And it should not be uh, made difficult by governments uh, for people to understand how software um, is working and how all those uh, decisions around us are, are happening. This should be something which should be encouraged by government. They should not be punished when they want to talk with others about how certain things work in our society. And finally, um, when people, organizations, governments want to use or develop software, free software should be the preferred choice. That's one, one goal we want to achieve, that whenever they have a decision, they will pick free software. So, yeah, those were the more long-term goals we think which is important on this uh, long journey to, to help to support those other freedoms in our democracy. I want to mention a few examples now for, um, from FSFE's work. Um, so one one example of what we recently did was uh, we had a small project, it's called Reuse. Um, it's uh, available under reuse.software. The idea is that um, we would like to make it easier for humans and for machines to understand license information. And um, for this, we boiled it down to three points, which uh, from the feedback we got uh, turned out to be the most important ones to achieve this. So first one is to make sure that you provide the exact text of each license which you use, so that you don't just add a link to this license or say it's this license, but that you actually provide the full license text. That you include um, a copyright notice and um, a license in each file. And that you provide an inventory for the included software. So those are those are three, three points which we would like to promote more, that especially people who start uh, programming and who write software, um, who are new to free software and not that deep involved, like uh, most of you probably are, that they also notice this and think about those issues. That is after it's easier for others to reuse software, to build up on the software, and you don't end up in the end with uh, um, with producing software which others cannot use because it was not clear how you meant something with the license information. So yeah, if you want to find out more about that, have a look at uh, this website, reuse.software. Beside that, um, during the last, uh, during this month, you might have read some media reports that the internet died and uh, that the European Union was uh, responsible for that. So that was probably then about the EU copyright reform. And um, in this process, you might not think about that free software is somehow, or most people might not think that free software is uh, influenced by a new EU copyright reform. And uh, most of the lawmakers also didn't think about free software when they were drafting those laws. But um, yeah, we, um, when we looked at this, at this reform, we figured out that there might be some bad influences for free software because those platforms which are, um, which is, are also regulated in this uh, copyright reform, um, they might also be code hosting platforms. Code, uh, software development platforms. 
So we raised this issue with uh, Safe Code Share um, a website where we had a petition. People could sign an open letter, and we were informing politicians about this that they might have missed what influence this might have on, on software development in Europe. So that's what we did in the past there. At the moment, we are in a situation that um, the European Parliament now decided on a version for them where um, there is an exclusion for free software development platforms in there. The European Council, they still have a version which also says that uh, free software uh, development platforms are excluded, but they added something in before that it's for non-profit parts. And I mean, all of you know that it doesn't make sense to say that non-profit open source development platforms are excluded because every free software development can also be commercial. So that's one of the things which we will now t uh, follow up there. This uh, whole process is now going in the so-called trial log. So the Commission, the Council, European Council, and the European Parliament will go into negotiations and try to find a compromise version. And uh, if they will be successful, that will happen probably before the European Parliament election. And then afterwards, that will be a directive. And this will then uh, be implemented by member states. So this whole process uh, will will still continue a little bit, so uh, the internet is not yet dead. So that's the good news. And um, the last example I want to give from recent work is, hmm, is our public money, public code campaign. So our goal with this campaign is that software finance with public money should be published under a free software license. And um, because we made a really good video from my perspective, which explains that way faster than I could explain it now, and uh, I would like to have uh, also a discussion with you, I will show you this video. And yes, I hope that it works with the sound because I cannot increase the volume here. Imagine for a moment, our government would treat our public infrastructure like our streets and public buildings, the same way it treats our digital infrastructure. Our members of parliament would work in a rented space where they weren't allowed to vote in favour of stricter environmental laws because the owner, a multinational corporation, didn't allow that kind of voting in its buildings. Nor will it allow a long overdue upgrade to more than 500 seats. This means some members of parliament have to stay outside in the street. And a couple of blocks away, a brand new gym is already being torn down just six months after it was built. It's being replaced with an exact replica at great expense. And the only difference, the new manufacturer also provides street ball as an added feature. Meanwhile, every night through a hidden back door in the city hall, documents that contain sensitive information on citizens, from bank data to healthcare records, are being stolen. But no one is allowed to do anything about it because searching for back doors and locking them would infringe the signed user agreement. And as absurd as this sounds, when it comes to our digital infrastructure, things like the software and programs that our governments are using every day, this comparison is pretty accurate. Because mostly, our administrations procure proprietary software. This means a lot of money goes into licenses that last for a limited amount of time and restrict our rights we aren't allowed to use our infrastructure in a reasonable way. And because the source code of proprietary software is usually a business secret, finding security holes or deliberately installed backdoors is extremely difficult and even illegal. But our public administrations can do better if all publicly financed software were to be free and open source we could use and share our infrastructure for anything and for as long as we wanted. We could upgrade it, repair it, and remodel it in any way to fit our needs. And because the open source in free software means that the blueprint is openly readable for everyone, this makes it much easier to find and close security holes. And if something practical and reliable was created digitally, 
Not only can you reuse the blueprint all over your country, but the actual thing itself can be deployed anywhere, even internationally. A great example of this is Fix My Street. Originally developed in Great Britain as a free software app to report, view and discuss local problems like potholes, it's now being used all over the world. Everyone benefits because new features and improvements are shared by everyone. If all our software were developed like this, we could stop struggling with restrictive licenses and could start thinking about where and how software could help us. We could concentrate on creating a better society for everyone. So, if you think that tomorrow's infrastructure should be in our own hands, help us now by sharing this video and visiting our website, publiccode.eu. It's time to make our demand. Public money, public code. So, yes, that was... Uh the short explanation of our campaign. Um, we have now around uh, 18,000 uh, 18, signatures for this, around 155 organizations which are also supporting this. I hope that after this uh, we might have 50 more signatures on this. And um, there are also in our cities who sign up for this, like the, um, the city of Barcelona also signed the open letter there. And uh, during the next months in preparation for the European Parliament election, we will again contact uh, politicians about this uh, demand and hope that they, will, um, that they will be open to some arguments there that we can make changes there. So, yeah, that's, uh, that will be a headers of there. And um, all those activities I just mentioned, the three examples, that's something which would not be possible without contributors and financial supporters of the FSFE. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank uh, people who donated to us and who are contributing to us. Uh, here, I thought I'll choose one of the quotes by one of the kernel developers. So if you would like to support us, that's very much appreciated. Beside that, um, my first teacher wrote this down in a book for me, and uh, it's an, American, uh, an African saying, many small people in many small places do many small things that can alter the face of the world. And so I would like to thank you for developing free software, for testing free software, for packaging free software, documenting free software, translating free software, um, telling others about free software, explaining it to them. So thank you very much for this. All of this work, sometimes it, it might feel a bit insignificant for the long-term development of, of humankind, but if you combine all those different actions by all of us individually, I think we can, we can change the world there. And that's an important thing because uh, when we think about the situation in, in the world, it's, there are still many, many people who don't... Um, who don't benefit from fundamental freedoms in our, uh, in, which we often take for granted in our society, like freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. Um, it's, it's something they have to fight for every day. And once you have those freedoms, it doesn't stop there. You constantly have to defend them and uh, to lift them. So that's why it's important that we also constantly um, fight for and defend software freedom, the right uh, to control our technology, uh, to support all those other freedoms, and that we, by this, uh, democratize software. So, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion with you. Tom, you had a question? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you've got another 50 signatures in the bag. <laughs> oh, yes. 
always me. Um, I have a comment on, um, on your point regarding the stupid decisions which are taken by software. Mm -hmm. I sort of disagree with this. In fact, it's not the software which takes uh, stupid decisions. It's that uh, uh, developers uh, initially think about a single decision for a single case. It is hard-coded in software, and the software replicates the same decision for any case. And in my opinion, it's a fundamental difference, because there is no way to argue with something which is already written. But in fact, this problem exists also out of software. In France, we have administration. You don't need to have the computers to have people who are stubborn and say, uh, I was told to do it this way, we'll do it this way. Mm -hmm. So uh, in my opinion, the problem is not uh, limited to software. It's a matter of uh, people applying rules without even thinking about them. Mm -hmm. uh, people getting increasingly stupid, developers being increasingly lazy, and in addition, software becoming increasingly complex, which will ultimately result in software which contains tons of stupid decisions, which have been hard coded by people who don't even understand why they are, were supposed to put them. Mm. And the people who have access to the code will not even understand what the code was supposed to do. So, uh, while I'm all for free software and I do use and contribute to free software myself, uh, I don't think that uh, all the solution uh, is there. I mean, uh, education is much more important and even uh, access to uh, write the code uh, is, uh, should be earned and not just granted to anyone. And, uh, we really need to educate developers to think and to take their time to produce good code and to really try to, uh, to think about the consequences of their code. And that's where I think that uh, in some aspects, uh, free software tends to degrade this for a stupid reason, which is that uh, today it is possible to say, I'm starting this project for now, it does almost nothing, but it will grow into something big because a lot of people will help me. And you release the first version, which is uh, 100 lines of code, completely stupid code, hoping that someone else will fix it for you. And that's a big problem. And for me, it's really uh, a proof that we need to educate people. Please do not write stupid code which does nothing or which is... Uh, which is broken by design. You should not publish your code if it is completely broken, if you don't trust it. Or you should openly ask for some help. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do this, I need some help to do it correctly because right now it is broken. But distributing broken code is a big problem in my opinion. So you're right, I, I was uh, not that clear about uh, that it's not software taking decisions, but it's actually people who develop this software who took those decisions. Mm -hmm. That's something which, uh, which is important because else it feels like you cannot change much there. But uh, all this, uh, when there are this, the discussions about artificial intelligence or algorithms are changing our, our rules, it's not, it's not just those algorithms, it's people who develop them. Um, but G Generally, I, I, the people who develop algorithms uh, are much smarter than those who implement them. And that's something to think about. And I'm pretty sure that right now, a lot of software which runs at various places like cars or whatever are already smarter than the people who are allowed to code other components in the car. The, just, just, just very quickly, so there was one, one point where, uh, which I also wanted to clarify. It's, uh, it's one piece of this puzzle, free software. But um, the... I mean, you, you portrayed a little bit uh, also the, okay, there are, there are stupid developers who don't think about certain things. I think that uh, it's, it's quite normal that as a developer, you develop software without always questioning your own, uh, the whole norms and laws, how you were brought up, which you will take into consideration when you write code. You might not think about uh, someone in some 
very uh, far other country who might have been brought up completely differently and where there are other laws which apply. So that's why I think it, it, will, it will not be possible for every developer to think about all those cases. And that's why it's important that when you pass on your software to others, that you give them the possibility to make those changes and also to understand what actual uh, rules we implemented in this and have a discussion about that. And that's the point where, uh, where free software comes in, which enables you to do this. Yeah. yeah, if you had every newcomer or developer have to ask for permission to publish something, you would effectively limit his freedom, which I don't think is what you want to do. No, that's not exactly this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, okay. No, so, um, I don't particularly want to limit. I want that people think before publishing. Uh, we, we probably all have dirty, stupid code that we write for ourselves, and that somewhat, sometimes we share with other people, and we forget to warn them about the impacts of this code being used in the wrong context. We probably all do have such code. You cannot pay this to everyone. No, that's why I prefer to because use education. So that's precisely the point. Instead of babysitting, we should educate people. Think twice before publishing your stupid code. That's the point. I don't agree. I think we should publish what we have. It works for my use case today. I know I have no error handling, but it's working. People should look at that when they decide to use it, and they should see that. You know, I shouldn't pretend that this is fully featured, bug-free code, but if I'm going to throw together and I do it frequently, throw together a hundred lines of crap that just does the job, and yes, I won't sleep at night if I try to use that for you know, something that matters, but it does the job for me. Why shouldn't I put that out there and somebody can use that as the basis for something sensible? It, but I think you're putting the focus in the wrong place. It's not on publishing it, it's on using somebody else's code, right? Uh, then I, I would say publish with a warning. It was designed, it was written for my use case, which is this use case. Yeah, That's exactly. It. Actually, as long as, you have, as long as you document that this code is crap, yes. <laughs> I do that all the time. I said, this code is crap, but it gets the job done. If you want to find a better way, go ahead. But hey, and I've actually had a lot of people still use that crap. But, on, but uh, I, I, uh, I think that, I mean, in, in such cases, it's. Um, it's not always the developer's uh, obligation to document exactly why you did something or how good the quality of that is. I mean, if you, if you write uh, something, you have your hobby Raspberry Pi project and do something with your washing machine at home or so, and then someone, uh, you, you publish the code and others who are using this for this purpose, they are all happy with that and make some smaller changes. That's all fine, but I mean, if you want to run that in a nuclear power plant and you take some code well, from somewhere, you should think about what responsibility you have when using code from others. I don't know. In 1991, there was, a, there was this guy who posted some code that said it's not going to be very good. It just works for me. It works on a few other things, but hey, if you want to play with it, go ahead. Look where we are today. I, I think if I may, I think it misses the point because, of course, uh, ethical, ethical education of developers is, is important and uh, code quality is, of course, important, but uh, I think your original point was that in order to have democracy, we have to have an open, an open rule book. So the rules will be wrong, like we have bugs in, in software, but at least we can look at them and understand them and modify them. Uh, maybe maybe that's, uh, that's what you wanted to, to convey, I don't know was a very good uh, summary of that point. <laughs> Thank you. My timer, we still have one minute left, but. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. You sure democracy is the right analogy you're looking for? I mean, we, we don't want to be voting on which patches get accepted. You get straight to mediocrity that way, you know? 
I, um, There's a reason why maintainers have some authority and are there for a particular reason. So I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the um, decision-making processes in free software projects. What I'm talking about is how um, software which is surrounding us is influencing democratic societies. I think in general it's very difficult to, um, to take the principle of democracy and apply that for organizations or for for, for um, software development uh, projects. That's something where, I mean, who's the demos for that? Can some user come and tell you like, uh, oh yeah, your crypto uh, library here, that really sucks and uh, I now get in 10,000 votes of some other people I know and they tell you do this differently. I think that's not something you have to accept. So you can take your own decisions how you're running your free software projects. You can decide that you are uh, developing this completely on your own and you're not accepting any patches and ignore everybody else. That's fine. What I was talking about and what I wanted to highlight here is when this software becomes an important part uh, about other people's lives, that you should not be the only person who can decide what changes you can make to the software. You should not be the only person who knows what exactly the software is doing. Um, that's the point where um, the democracy perspective comes in. I think it's, it's something in, in free software, it's, it's uh, actually also something about education that people understand that if something is free software or proprietary software, it's different if you are developing something openly and in a wider group or if you are developing something completely on your own without accepting feedback by users, other developers and so on. Because you might uh, have to adhere to some deadlines for your commercial product uh, which, uh, where you use this free software for. So I think that's something which is absolutely fine. The history might show which approaches might be better for which cases. I think that, that's not the point where I'm arguing about uh, open development models versus closed development models, but how this fits in in a democratic society. Okay, thank you very much. So to complete this day, uh, if you have uh, ever attended Canary CPs, you know why I'm in front of you right now. In fact, uh, I only want your money. So I will let this for a couple of minutes to infuse in your brain. <laughs> so here we are for a charity auction. Uh, we do think it's really important to support the FSFE. So every year, you know, we are choosing a project that we think it deserves to be supported. Matthias, this, for my opinion, a very good presentation uh, of what is the goal in who, uh, our digital life, social life, about free software. So we are very proud here to support him. And to support him, uh, we have a couple of items that we put on auction. Uh, we will have two signed T-shirts. Uh, even if the French have won the World Cup, the football is not really my game. And in fact, my heroes are more likely in this room. So we will ask, just after this short introduction, all the speakers present in this room to sign this T-shirt to give the value to these blank T-shirts. 
We will have also one book. Uh, Michael wrote a very nice book about the Linux programming interface, and he will sign it for you, so that will make a great value. And to be honest, it's a little bit more like this. So this very nice book will be on the auction too, and thank you, Michael, for offering this book for the assembly. Uh, I also know well you very much, so I know you have beer. So three years ago, I've been brewing some beers for you. So they stay in my cave for all this long time. Um, some of you already tested it the year before and enjoyed it. So what does three years old mean? I know you are a software developer, so you have different scale in mind. So what was the kernel release three years ago? Does anyone have a guess? 4.5, Sweden 14.38 and 4.00. It was in April 2015. So I will write these numbers into the bottles, and I will also ask all the speakers to sign these bottles that will be uh, with this numbering. On this way, that will, for the winner, keep in mind that this bottle has been brewed at 4.00 uh, time. So. Let's sign right now uh, all the bottles and all the stuff. So it will take a couple of minutes. Please stay in the room during this signing. And just after, we will start the auction for uh, FSFE. Thank you. So please, all the speakers, come on stage. And we'll sign both t-shirts here and the bottle here. Do you have a marker? I'll just... Yeah, please. So please see each of those. Because that is a value. It's not the BSD double. <laughs> it's my own little signature. It's something I actually drew, first drew in first grade, way before BSD even existed. Not before Unix. Unix started at the. Can we write the number here? This one is Signed off by Steve Roster. That's how they got the name my name on the That's true. You got a pen, do you want this? It's a horrible green colour, does anyone have? <laughs> 
There's a t-shirt as well. Where's the t-shirt? Where's the t-shirt? What's over there? So let's start, guys. So I hope I've been uh, able to hypnotize you with uh, all this money. So I propose that we start the auction with the first shirt. So you know the game, the one which is providing the more money wins the item. Feel free about it. We are taking everything. We are taking cash. We are taking credit cards. We are taking uh, bitcoins. Uh, we are taking uh, RSA keys. We are taking uh, everything that have value. So feel free to put an action on it. So let's start with the third t-shirt. So we're starting for five euros. Five euros, please. 
Thank you. Who for 10? 10, Anis, thank you. Who for 15? OK. Let's try with the kitten. <laughs> so 15, it works. Thank you. <laughs> Who for 20 now? <laughs> Please. 20, thank you, Michael. Who for 25? For, thank you. 30? 30 euros, maybe? It's a beautiful kitten. It is praying for you, please, for 30. 25? One time? Two time? Three time? Thank you. Uh, maybe I will take the XL for you. So let's take for the second one. So let's restart the auction. So who for five? Five, please. Thank you. 10? Michael? 15? Okay, let's try another cat. Fif <laughs> 15, <laughs> thank you. 20, maybe. 20. 20, 25, maybe. 25, thank you. Who for 30? Please. 30, please. It's a much better case. Yeah, this one is better. It's praying literally. 30, thank you, David. Anyone else? 30, one time. Two time, three time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's start now for the the book, maybe. Oops. So the wonderful book from Michael, which is a little bit thinner than expected. So you can make it. So we starting for we start for this one at twenty. So who for twenty euros? Twenty. 25 maybe, 25, 30, who for 35, 35, 40 maybe, thank you, 45, 50, 50, 55, 55. The book has a value of 60 euros on the market without the hand signing of Michael. So 55 to my right, 60, 65, Someone? Thank you. 70. Thank you, Patrick. 70. 75. It's a very beautiful book. You will learn a lot of things. Took me years to write. <laughs> <laughs> On minutes to sell, so it's not really fair. 80. Yes? yes. Thank you, Anis. 80. 85. Yes, thank you, Patrick. 90. 90. <laughs> Many years. You can do it, please. I don't have cat. Maybe cats are more efficient, so let's back to the cat. Let's put the cat back. <laughs> 90, someone? 85? Yes. So one time, two time. Three times. Thank you. Right. So now let's start for the 31438 release, which is a 1.5 liter brown beer that I brewed, I brewed sorry, uh, three years ago for you. Uh, maybe some of you tasted it on another release, so I think we will start at 10. 20. 20. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. 20 directly. 25. 30. 30. 35. 35. Thank you. 40. 40. Thank you. 45. Yes. I have to open my, my scope. 50. Let's step back. 50 euros. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so we are at 50, right? Am I right? No, 45? 45. Who for 50? Sorry. I lose my brain. 50 euros? No? No one? Yes. Michael, thank you. It took me years to make it also. <laughs> Oh, 
50, so now 55, please. It's for FSFE, it's not for me, thank you. 60. Six. They are doing together, it's, they are shitty. Now who for 60, someone? One time? No regrets? Two time? Three time. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe the 4.0 will have more success. So let's start at uh, maybe 30. It's an option. Hmm? You said we have to share it? So do we restart the uh, traditional auction? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's restart it. Let's pray then. Um, <laughs> so let's restart at uh, uh, 30. 35? 40? 45? 50? 50? Please. 50, thank you. 55. It's two liter, thank you. So it's a little bit more than the first one, and it's four or zero. It's even better. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. It's still supported, right? It's LTS, and the beer is also LTS. You can keep it for years. It's even better every year. So, really, oh, four sixty. <laughs>